All right, hello everybody. We are live here today to talk about machine learning for algorithmic trading with Stefan Jansen. I'm gonna bring him on in just a minute, but I did wanna say that this is actually the first time that I am triple streaming. So we're going live on my LinkedIn live account on PACT's YouTube channel and also the Story by Data Twitter account. So find the platform you want to view this on and go ahead and join the conversation because the cool thing is we're actually selecting three winners that will win Stefan's uh, really massive, really awesome machine learning for algorithmic trading book. And the winner is going to be announced in, in, in a day or so by Ravit Jain from PACT. So at this point, I will bring on Stefan Jansen up on stage, but I want to just quickly introduce him. He is the founder and lead data scientist at Applied AI and also the author of the, the book that I was just showing you. Hello, Stefan. Hey, everybody. Hi, Kate. How's it going? Great. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And All right. So, who's joining? Yes, yes. Um, well, while we wait for people to join us, why don't you start with telling some, you know, telling everybody a little bit about yourself and maybe where you're tuning in from? Yeah, right now uh, I'm tuning in from Austin, Texas. Um, I'm originally from from Germany, uh, so I've come a long way. We escaped the New York winter for for a few months. Um, but I've been in Texas before. It's actually a pretty nice place. Uh, you're pretty dynamic. Lots of tech moving into Austin. It's one of the places in the U.S. that's been growing the fastest over the last 10 years with, a, with an extra boost over the last year with lots of people from the Bay Area and so moving here. You're in Texas for, for work or you're there on vacation? What are you doing there? No, we moved here for, for at least the, the extended winter, you know, until things, you know, get back to normal again in New York. Back to normal. When is that happening? Can we? Can we? Do you have you know, we never. You know, hope hope dies last. So um, you know, we we hope that by the end of maybe around mid year, you know, July August. You know, I hope. What do you think? Oh, what do I think? I actually thought the whole thing would be over in two months since it started, but uh, clearly I'm too much of an optimist and know nothing. So don't ask me when things are going back to normal. Um, just looking into the comments, we've got Andrew here saying hello from London. Marcos, hello, Marcos. Jessica, people are definitely filtering in here. Wisconsin, Minneapolis. All right, India, Kimberly's here from New York City. All right, awesome. So, Stefan, tell us a little bit about yourself. What is it that you do besides write really huge books? Yeah, so uh, my, my current venture, uh, Applied AI, works with um, companies in different industries. Typically, uh, we work with senior executives to help them figure out a strategy to use data science, machine learning, you know, and, and all that uh, throughout the organization. And then also help them to actually implement things. So prioritize, you know, initiatives and get them implemented. Uh, we do this, you know, often ourselves and then help you know, companies build teams and build a habit of using data and predictive analytics to take better decisions. Okay, and I've been awesome. doing that for the last five, six years. Before that, I was a partner in, a, in an investment firm. Uh, before that, I was an executive in FinTech and electronic payments and, and all the, the stuff that's also pretty dynamic these days. Yeah, absolutely. So you've kind of stayed in a, a similar field, but different roles along the way. Yeah, except for the fact that before that, I was working in international development. So I used to work with Gates Foundation and World Bank and other things. So I've been living around the world, spent over three years in Asia, living in Indonesia, working at the Central Bank. And I worked in China and Africa and I lived in wow. Brazil and Mexico and Guatemala and whatnot. So I've been you've around. You've been around. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, great. So Ravit is here. I think you know Ravit, Stefan. Of course I do, Ravit. Hey, how's it going? He's saying thank you for the masterpiece. And Hari here is asking to show the book, right? The Machine Learning for Algorithmic Trading book. So I do have a copy here. I'm sure, I'm sure you have one somewhere, Stefan. I but do. Where is it? Do you have one? Should, we, should we hold it up at the same time? Of Are you course. Ready to hey. Awesome. So one of the it's questions. Real. <laughs> yes. Not empty. Payoffs. I wanted. I wanted to do a little fun challenge for the live audience here because you can see that it's it's not a small book. If anybody can guess the exact number of pages of this book without going to Amazon and cheating, that would be cool. So place your guesses, how long is the book? Um, but before we actually get into talking about the book and kind of the process that you went, that went into writing the book, 
I'd like to just start a conversation about machine learning for algorithmic trading. What really is that for those who are not familiar with it and how do you apply this to real life? Yeah, so um, obviously machine learning per se has been has been a pretty hot topic uh, for you know five years at least, more like probably 10 years. So um, investment as an industry has been coming to the machine learning table maybe over the last three years or so. Uh, but of course, investment has a very long quantitative history. I mean, there's decades and decades of research trying to figure out which variables, which indicators are sort of predictive of returns because people have been trading, you know, uh, since, um, you know, the first company was started basically or listed. So um, the idea of using machining for trading really has gained popularity, um, uh, especially once also alternative data became uh, a thing, alternative being the data that is normal in all the other businesses. So that's not alternative, but the standard data like uh, uh, pay a credit card transaction data or things you read on social media and satellite images and everything that you know is used or generated by other businesses in the normal course of business uh, that is now increasingly used in um, in, in machine learning in, in, in the investment industry with the goal of getting some insights into how maybe a specific, a specific industry is going to do or a specific company or a specific brand or product. And in the past, they also, they've also done this. They would send like shoppers to malls to figure out whether there's more foot traffic or less, uh, for instance, to see how consumer spending would, would evolve. Now, of course, you have credit card transaction data. So, so now we have much more information and there was an incentive to, to invest in not only the, the data itself and the infrastructure to manage it, but also in the skills to process the data in a sort of smarter way and get you know the ability to look into the future through through machine learning so that of course was very promising because the, the general idea in finance is that you know efficient markets you can't really extract any information from from past prices because you know the if there were any information you know somebody would have already uh, you know made those gains just like the dollar bill on the on the sidewalk you know that can't be there because somebody would have picked it up so, so that's kind of where machine learning uh, comes in, new data uh, come, uh, becoming available as, as elsewhere. And many funds trying to figure out now how they can use this for an actual trading strategy, right? Because as we may, as we briefly talked about before we got started, what's, what's specific or slightly different about using machine learning in trading is that you always have to not only think about your standard machine learning workflow, which is, you know, you get some data and you have some objective or outcome you want to predict and you do your whole feature engineering and data cleaning and model setup and cross validation evaluation and so forth piece. But once you get predictions, say for returns of, you know, the, those stocks that are in the maybe S&P 500, then you also need to think about, so what am I going to do with those now? So am I going to buy the best 10 stocks or short the you know the worst 10 stocks or something else and how am i going to manage risk and da 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 da, da right so you have a whole sort of normal trading um, um you know workflow that tags on to the machine learning piece right away and your model is only as good as it allows uh, the trading strategy to be after uh, the fact right so you have this sort of two-step approach that is integra integrated and that's yeah. what the book is about, basically, to demonstrate how you can integrate these steps. So build models that are hopefully predictive and then see how they would fare in historical market conditions. And then you get a sort of monetary feedback on how good the model is actually. Right. So that monetary means, well, I made 10 percent per year or 100 percent or I lost everything, you know. So so you get a little bit of of. Um, of, you know, of course, results across the board, but you get a very specific result. Uh, actually in dollar terms, you know, rather than, well, the AUC or my mean squared error or the correlation is X, you know. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you sort of touched on this already, but a relevant question came in from Matthew asking how efficient will machine learning algorithms work in the stock universe, right? The real it's, world. Yeah, it's super efficient. It was handed down to us from heaven and it's a machine to build, to print money. Well, of course not, you know, so we, <laughs> that would be uh, great, but you know, we know life a little bit, you know, these things that sound too good in life, they're really true. Yeah. So machine learning is of course a good tool. And as usual, to the extent that you have complex data, it will be more 
um, suitable or more effective at extracting information from that data than humans. Yeah. You know, we know that, but markets are very competitive. So the challenge there is that even though you may have a model that really looks good over the last three to five years, it may be only a certain time that you're able to actually make money based on that in the market, or maybe not at all, because, you know, maybe others have already figured out that this could work and they're all trading on it and the gains are very small and your trading costs are going to eat the gains, you know? Yeah. So, so it's hard and sometimes you need a little bit of scale, but you need to take a look at funds like Renaissance Technologies. Uh, it's founded by Jim Simons. It's this legendary, um, fund run by pure scientists. So there are no typical Wall Street traders in there. There's actually just a bunch of mathematicians and physicists and, and astrophysicists and whatnot. And they have been using algorithms and machine learning since the 80s. Hmm. And they have achieved returns above 50% per year since then. Like no other fund is coming even close to that. They're managing around 20, 25 billion dollars or a bit more these, these days, but it's mostly internal money because they also can't grow too big. So it's not like a Bridgewater with 200 billion plus, uh, but the, the, um, the returns are amazing and they started very early and, um, they have been using these tools, uh, since, since the eighties. So it, it can work, but it ain't easy. Right. So, yeah. Absolutely. So it's not a money printing machine for those who are wondering. Now, going to uh, the comments, we have a lot of guesses as to the number of pages. So, Stefan, you're going to have to tell them the answer at some point. So we've got 780, 1067, 587, 1200, 733. We have a lot of yeah, 1500. Wow. Two shards, so 20. <laughs> So on the, on the last page at the bottom, it says, uh, can you read that? Where is it here? 790. Oh, wow. The 780 came really close. Pritam said 1800. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to keep now writing. That's, now that's, at, but, but actually there is like some Roman number numerals before that. So there's, ah, actually, nice. there's like 22, uh, you know, that's all the intro stuff table of contents. So it's like 800 and a bit, I guess. You know. Awesome. Yeah. Michael, uh, Michael says it's a nice surprise seeing us here together. He guessed 407, but he's curious to see the uh, average guesses. Michael, Michael Papas. How is it going, Michael? Michael, please, please. take the average and report back <laughs> upon in the next few minutes. Um, okay. So let's, Let's move on to more questions. We got one here. Why is the book so thick? Is algorithmic trading difficult? <laughs> I just hit all these little jokes in there in the footnotes to check if anybody actually reads this, uh, you know. <laughs> the, so the book has, what is it, 24 chapters or so. Um, it's a second edition. So actually it has more pages. Uh, we had to kind of squeeze the margins a little bit. It has. Like more like 850 pages and like sort of the original uh, format. Yeah. Uh, the reason is that um, the book tries to, first of all, give you five chapters of sort of background, you know, how do you use financial data, alternative data, and a little bit of the background of the research that, you know, financial economists have come up with over the last, you know, 30, 40 uh, years at least to, you know, evaluate all sorts of different hypotheses, how you could predict returns which is useful for you as a starting point, right? Because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Right. And then there's a whole piece of how do you actually manage a portfolio, right? So one thing is to predict the returns for one stock. Another thing is now that you suddenly own 20 or 30 or 40 of them, well, how much do you invest in each of them? And you know, how could you optimize that potentially? So there's a whole kind of um, piece of content on that. And then we have, what is it, like seven, eight chapters on sort of the, fund I call it the fundamentals of machine learning, which is from linear regression to gradient boosting. So the typical algorithm for like tabular data um, mm -hmm. with, uh, with, a, with an excursion to backtesting. So we use Zipline and Backtrader, which are two popular Python libraries for backtesting um, in the book. So we explain a little bit how they work, what the architecture is and show you how to work with them to load your own data and and you know, several important steps in the workflow. And uh, then we have one three chapter part on natural language processing. 
as I mentioned, alternative data is kind of a real big thing. So for instance, processing financial statements of companies and trying to figure out if you could predict earning surprises based on what companies report. Um, there's, there's an example there using, using word to vec uh, kind of technology um, um, algorithms. And then there's deep learning. So then there's another five or six chapters on recurrent neural nets and convolutional neural net nets, and then the real hip stuff like uh, generative adversarial networks, which is like very new. Uh, the goal is to generate synthetic training data, mm -hmm. right? So one thing in finance is that actually the data in finance, the pure market data is actually quite limited. And that's because you have only that many equities, for instance, that are trading worldwide. Say it's 100,000, which is like a large number. Right. But, you know, that's really what you have. And so they trade and sure, they trade on a tick basis and some trade very often and others uh, less so. But you take the NASDAQ, for instance, tick data. So we use an example where you download the NASDAQ actual real tick data, which reflects kind of the order book and what's really happening in an exchange. That data set for one day is 10 gigabyte in size. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, you know, it's a substantial data set, but look at what Google is hosting on YouTube, right? I mean, look at the amount of data video is generating online and so forth, right? So uh, if you look at web scale, financial data is actually somewhat limited. So yeah. that means that if you always try to train models on those data, at some, time, at some point you're gonna hit a limit, right? So you, you run into risks of overfitting, on that limited universe of data and maybe also future scenarios, you know, because the world keeps on changing, they may also not be really contained in those data. So yeah. wouldn't it be awesome if we could generate artificial data that is basically representative of financial markets, but slightly different, right? So same, yeah. same, but different. And so people have been working on this and there are some interesting architectures that produce reasonable results. That's like very early stage uh, from the research frontier. So this is not like a off the, shelf, off the shelf solution. You can just take and implement, but it's something that's in the works. And maybe in three to five years, actually, you can do this properly at scale. And all the large funds, or at least some of them, are certainly working on this. So that's kind of something that, so I'm in the book, we um, replicate a paper that was published at NeurIPS, I think in 2000, at the end of 2019. Um, so that's really brand new stuff. So we show how to, how to do that, right? So rather than doing the celebrity image GANs, stuff, right, we, right. we use the, uh, we use financial data to generate time series of stock prices. The, yeah. So, this is new for me. When I think of GANs, I was thinking of the, the images that float around saying, this is not a real person, but I guess that's, that's a really good use of GANs to create synthetic training data. For, yeah, for they tried to, the first application was in the medical domain, actually. Okay. Because in, in, in medicine also, you have, of course, issues accessing patient data, right? Privacy and whatnot. But of course, you could think, well, if I had, so in, in, there's an example, um, it's, it's a lab from ETH Zurich uh, from Switzerland. They use um, uh, various measurements that is taken in the uh, ICU, in the intensive care unit to see what the status of a, of a patient is, right? They have all these different things attached to you and then keep track. And then they can predict whether, you know, you're going to whatever, you know, deteriorate dramatically. So they were able to generate synthetic data based on some 10,000 or so patient samples. And they were actually able to train a model on the synthetic data and predict reasonably well, um, as good as doing this on real data, what would happen to a patient uh, in the real world. Right. So that's great, right? Because, you know, getting all this data from, from patients is really cumbersome and costly. So if you find a different way of getting there and getting similar results, that's great. So they, they were the first to come up with a recurrent sort of neural network architecture that uh, would apply the GAN logic to, to time series. And that's then be ported to financial data. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we have a question here from Raul that I know you just can't wait to discuss. It's all about GameStop. So would machine learning algorithm method have prevented the GameStop loss that major companies experienced last week? So that's a really good question. I think maybe. <laughs> um, there, I think there are some cases uh, when the world changes dramatically, like would it have detected COVID, right? Uh, coming, coming out of the woods or would it you know, detect these sunspot events that are pretty novel? 
maybe in near term, right? I mean, certainly you see systematic funds, so quant funds that use some sort of machine learning join the trend pretty quickly. Would mm -hmm. you have predicted before the onset? Maybe. I mean, clearly there was some chat on Twitter. I mean, apparently GameStop was been, has been discussed since 2019, on and off, but other companies as well, right? So I think that's a definitely maybe uh, that could have been detected. There are other technologies that are more like screening information in real time and keeping a good eye, like things that data miner does and so forth, that are not so much trying to predict something in specific, but more like monitoring um, a relevant universe of, of information and then trying to react quickly as things change, you know? Mm -hmm. so it, it's hard when, you know, you have new patterns that are really different from what happened in the past for an algorithm to pick that up. Yeah, absolutely. And we have uh, we have several questions asking what book we're talking about. So I don't know if I could just put this down. It won't stay here. This is the book, guys, Machine Learning for Algorithmic uh, Trading. Stefan's the author. And since we're talking about the book, why don't you tell people, Stefan, who, who is this book for? Is this for traders? Is this for business managers, data scientists? Who's it yeah, for? so I think, um, first of all, there, there are some prerequisites that help sort of, um, you know, establish maybe some baseline. So, so the idea is that you are already familiar with using Python and you have already, you know, some fluency in the typical data science libraries like PAMDAS, you know, the scikit-learn interface and workflow, and it helps if you have some background in financial markets, you know, then beyond that, you have to be really interested in spending some time in experimenting um, with, you know, different approaches. Um, you have to be willing to invest in thinking about what data you could use, uh, because very often you need to go above and beyond the standard historical price series, because as I said, there's very little information in them. So it's very difficult to systematically make, make money from that. So you have to think about other sources. All of that is some, some, since that will take some time, you should be somebody who has, you know, a serious interest in, in using this either for, you know, your own personal um, money generating uh, hobby, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, or professionally and the professional, um, set of, of people that have been, that are portfolio managers, analysts, and the like, that are moving into, um, into using machine learning, is fairly large, right? I mean, most, uh, say, say, masters of finance and whatnot, you know, that are quantitatively oriented, they're all integrating machine learning in their curriculum. So, so I'm getting a lot of requests from, from students, you know, advanced undergrad, uh, graduate students, that are all interested in learning this, because what that book tries to do is, to really sort of give you some of the theory, but more of all, give you a lot of different ways how you could implement this in practice. And all of these are then building blocks that you can combine and use and, you know, apply, you know, either at your, in, in your work or, or at home. All right. Awesome. Thanks for that. So you mentioned that the use of Python, and I know the book includes um, a lot of code that you can actually replicate on your own for practice, right? So what are some of the Python libraries that one would use when, when working with this uh, machine learning? Or yes, so, so maybe it's, it's uh, useful to point out that a big part of the book is actually making available really a lot of examples. So there's a GitHub repository that comes with the book that's very easy to find online. You know, just look for my name and machine learning for trading. There's more than 150 notebooks that um, you know show you how to get the data, work with it, and translate the model results into a trading strategy that you can evaluate. So the the libraries we use are um, on the machine learning side. There are no major surprises. You know, I mean, we use the standard you know pandas, NumPy uh, universe, and then you know you have Scikit-Learn and LightGBM or CatBoost or uh, then, of course, for deep learning, TensorFlow or PyTorch. And for natural language, uh, you know, you have also some of the standard things from Spacey to Gensin, text and 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 whatnot, or NL, uh, NLTK. So, so they're, they're on, the, on the machine learning side, there are no, like, big sort of novelties, really, uh, because we're building on the shoulders of the open source giants. Um, and then on the financial side, uh, you have... Um, Zipline relatively prominently uh, because it's relatively fast um, to run a backtest uh, there if you use the so-called pipeline API. Uh, Backtrader is an alternative. 
And uh, all this is, has been originally developed by Quantopian, which used to be a crowdsourced hedge fund, which unfortunately closed its door at the end of last year. And oh. some of the leadership moved over to Robin Hood. Mm. So, um, so that means the platform that used this open source to actually allow you to develop algorithms and participate in competition is no longer available, but the software that allows you to do the same thing at home still exists. So that's what the book uses. And they have a few other pieces around that backtesting engine, uh, things called like things like Alpha Lens, which allows you to evaluate the signal quality of individual factors or PyFolio, which allows you to evaluate the, uh, the performance of a portfolio over time from various risk perspectives. It's a very rich set of metrics and visualizations that you can get. There are also libraries like TALib that compute all sorts of standard uh, technical indicators uh, from market data. Mm -hmm. uh, so we use that quite a bit because most of the examples for the basic strategies, they rely on market data because it's the, 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 the data source that's most easily accessible. You know? We have some fundamentals and several alternative sources, um, but mostly we rely on market data just because that's freely available still to some extent. Uh, you can use Quantopian, uh, worked with Quandl. So Quandl makes available a data set that at least runs until mid-2018. That's of reasonably good quality. A mm -hmm. new source is Alpaca, which is a new uh, provider that also makes available free data uh, daily. And I think they're thinking about higher frequency as well. Um, so so these, are, these are accessible without major investments. I also work with a partner called AlgoSeq. They make available professional grade data. So their clients are hedge funds and the like. And uh, we use minute data uh, in, in one example. Um, and so if you're interested in investing sort of in actual quality uh, data where you know really what you're getting is what happened in the market at the time and not, well, it was probably approximately right, you right. know, then, then this would be uh, another good source, you know. But of course, you have to then pay some money. And that's nothing we can use in a book that's, you know, meant to sort of address a broad audience. Okay. Yeah. Very, very cool. Thank you. So by the way, that GitHub, GitHub link that you mentioned, that's also in the session description, if people wanted to find that quickly. Um, all right. Ready for more questions, Stefan? Of course. Okay. Awesome. So Daniel's asking, what courses do you recommend for learning machine learning applied in finance? Aside from the book, I guess, because obviously get the book, you know? Yeah. Um, the, there isn't really, so I noticed, uh, for instance, the, when we brought out the first uh, edition, which was a little, you know, hastily and wasn't quite ready, that even attracted quite a bit of attention because there wasn't that much alternative, you know, it wasn't necessarily because it was such an amazing book, but it was like a lot of people are interested and they're on the book side, there is uh, one recent book, um, um, I think it's also just called Machine Learning and Finance by uh, Igor Halperin, uh, uh, Matthew Dixon and one other co-author that's a little more academic in nature and picks up several important pieces from the research front. So there's a lot of reinforcement learning um, mm -hmm. and reverse reinforcement learning and some other aspects. Uh, so that's really interesting. But it's more like research frontier, similar to what Marcos Lopez de, Pr de Prado, which is probably the most prominent um, algorithmic or machine learning for trading, um, you know, representative. He used to run quant trading at Guggenheim, like a large $10 billion plus fund, uh, has also has two PhDs, was at AQR for a while, and is now in Abu Dhabi uh, at the Sovereign Wealth Fund and runs quantitative search. So he's like a real huge guy, but what he publishes is like super interesting stuff, but it's literally, this has been developed yesterday by one of the leaders in, in, in the field. So it doesn't teach you the basics to get there, you know? Mm -hmm. so. What is there in, court, in terms of courses? Uh, there is something on Coursera, I think, also developed by Igor Halperin, who I just mentioned as the author of the book, uh, while he was at NYU, um, that has some examples. Um, and so Coursera has one or two other things uh, that also address risk management, I think, and factors, factor models, and stuff like that. But compared to the generic machine learning offerings from Andrew Ang to, uh, you know, um, uh, deep learning AI and so forth. There's, there's clearly much fewer, um, that's available. Yeah, absolutely. I was at a conference probably uh, maybe two years ago, pre COVID, obviously this was an in-person conference and the presentation was on machine learning and finance. And one of the main things that we 
discovered there that even universities at this point have issues finding content to teach their students on this topic because there's just such a limit on the, on the resources. So I think that's part, maybe partly why the book is blowing up, but at the same time, it's a really great book and it's very well written. It's, it's, it's massive, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like it because it, the chapters are so well, um, I guess they're distinct enough that you can kind of take it a piece at a time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that in terms of like, if you're interested in reading the book, uh, you don't, and also probably shouldn't read it like cover to cover. I mean, if you want to, read. but uh, it's good to pick and choose. Uh, you want to maybe take a brief look at the introductory piece on how you get the data if you're interested in, in something in, in, in particular, but you can pick the pieces that you really care about. If you want to learn how the backtesting stuff works, then, you know, take a look at that picture, uh, at that chapter. And then you can say, I want to know how, how I could use gradient boosting or I can use word to vec Then you can just go to those and it will reference other chapters if they matter, you know, so you can always, uh, so it's not like you have to get through the 800 pages to get anything done. You can actually get started yeah. quickly. Absolutely. Maybe on the, why there's so few, um, or not so relatively little available on machine learning. And I'm also, so I'm an economist originally by training. I also have a background in computer science, but on the economist side, and that also applies to finance, uh, there's a long tradition in using linear regression for everything, you know, um, because you can measure the significance and you can publish and whatnot. So there's a very established way of doing things. And a lot of PhDs have been trained in this, in this way. So maybe different from some other um, novel industries, right? Like the advertisement industry where you have Facebook and Google emerging, that are yeah. ready to embrace new things. In finance, it takes longer because the skepticism, oh, is this really better than what we've been doing and we all know this so well, it you know naturally takes longer and also for a good reason. I mean, they have a lot of experience, right? It's not just <laughs> ignorance and resistance to novelty, but there is literally decades and decades, Nobel prizes have been awarded for this. It's very sophisticated stuff. So the bar is a little higher to demonstrate that machine learning is, is better or useful because you really have to beat an existing status quo, right? Yeah. It's not like a tabula rasa for greenfield kind of situation as in under other industries, you know? Do you think there's also a hesitation for people to share kind of their secrets to winning the market? Yes, I mean, probably if you look at the research departments at Google and Facebook that, you know, built their reputation on open sourcing and publishing things, uh, you know, the so nobody knows what Renaissance technology does ever. Like there's yeah. zero information about this. People sign watertight NDAs. So there's literally over 30, 40 years, nothing has leaked what their secret source is. Wow. And the other hedge funds are very similar. So you see the difference, right? Yeah, so clearly some of these things are are being used, you know, uh, but you have to join them to learn about it. And then you also can't talk about it. So yeah, exactly. Then you can't share it, but at least then you'll know it. Um, okay. I know we have probably what, 10 minutes left. We'll shift to just taking questions from the audience. Quick reminder to everyone who's listening live right now, we will select three winners after the show to receive the free, uh, free copy of the book. Ravik Jain from PACT is going to announce those winners. For now, we're going to shift back to questions, and the winners are basically chosen based on questions asked. So go ahead and ask questions on machine learning for algorithmic trading. Uh, we're going to move on to Greg's question here. Can you describe the controls around algorithmic trading that helps avoid dangerous massive sell-offs and the potential for an AI-generated crash? Um, I'm assuming you, you're talking about more the overall market rather than my sort of personal risk management. Um, right. So you had so. a few, you had, you had a few, you know, like flash crash and, you know, quants piling up, uh, you know, in, in, in a certain direction. Uh, I think this is something that's evolving, you know, um, you have some correcting forces in there too, right? Because individual funds or, you know, those that run quant funds and have experienced these things, they have also no interest in experiencing losses in, in this way. So um, there, there's to some ex extent, at least there will probably, hopefully at least some, some self-correction, but I think we're literally entering new territory that nobody really exactly knows what could potentially go wrong over the next five or 10 years as more and more sophisticated quant traders 
uh, participate. You know, already a large majority of the of the trading volume is electronically, um, you know, issued or or, or, or or driven. So, I don't know. I don't. I don't have an answer to that. The risks are, are clearly there. The regulators are looking at that, but right. I I don't think they are at this point up to speed. You know, if you cite lack of resources for the general uh, folks to catch up, it's not like the regulators are clearly ahead of the curve, for instance, you know, I think we've seen an extremely rapid development on the data and technology front over the last five, maybe 10 years, where many other things still need to catch up uh, with this. So we'll probably experience some maybe unpleasant, hopefully not, but potentially unpleasant surprises over the next two, three, five years or so. All right, well, the optimist in me says, no, we won't. It's all gonna be okay, guys, <laughs> but you're probably right. All right, moving on to uh, I'm an optimist in the long run for sure, right? Uh, so yeah, I think the but I guess so. today, they clearly outweigh, you know, the occasional well, now we're down ten percent suddenly, nobody really knows why, and then we're back up, you know. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question here is Stefan, please provide some insights on financial feature engineering, keeping in mind trading strategies. Yeah. So. Feature engineering is, as so often, really the most important aspect of the whole thing. And it's not just how you engineer them, it's also what goes into this. So what's really special about finance is that it's, it helps to first figure out what is actually the universe I'm interested in. And it probably already helps if you say, I'm not going to go after the 100 most liquid and most heavily traded stocks where everybody is investing huge amounts to gain an edge, right? Yeah. If you look, say... Uh, you know, some developing market or smaller caps and so forth, maybe some sector. And maybe you can take an approach where you try to gain. So there are these quantum mentals, you know, they, they try to combine fundamental investing with quant methods. They often really think very hard about what kind of data sets could they get about an industry from the suppliers of that industry or what have you that could give them some insights into how the industry is going Doing, doing down the road or a specific company, right? I mean, at a high level, you could try to get all the, you could try to get data from all the suppliers of Apple, you know, just to name a, a well-known company. But of course, we don't want something that big. That would maybe give you some insights on how it's going to do three or six months down the road. That's one thing. On the other hand, if you, have, if you work with market data um, using at least a diverse range of indicators that capture like important phenomenon like if you're into finance, you know, things like momentum, you know, that there's a certain trend in the making, volatility is important, you know, all of this kind of goes back to what financial economists have found to be relatively um, significantly to be associated with future returns, but that's no guarantee. So to be really have an edge, you probably want to think hard what other data sources you could use. Right. Social media is something that always comes to mind. It's another source that's too easy to access almost to be successful. You know, but um, um, so you, you probably have to think a little bit harder, you know, that's why the large funds, they have big budgets to invest yeah. in, in specific data sets, you know, because that really drives the thing. So, of course, you can on the in terms of to more specifically talk about feature engineering, the book mentions all sorts of different smoothing techniques and and so forth. So they are all things of uh, all, the, all kind of techniques that you can apply to maybe increase the signal to noise ratio a little bit in your features. But mm -hmm. very often the big difference will come from really discovering useful additional data that you can use, you know, rather than tweaking your algorithm a little bit and, you know, changing the number of the depth of your gradient boosting tree or add a layer to the neural network. Very often the big leap will come from, I really have a good idea of a new data set or how I can get some text data set source and extract some interesting work uh, uh, information from there. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. We have, um, uh... A great question from Tyler. If he doesn't win the book, where can he get the book? Uh, it is available um, at bookstores, which maybe doesn't help that much because I guess many, many are closed, but you certainly can get it on Amazon. Uh, there's also a website. So if you look for ML4 with the number 4, trading.io, then you can uh, see actually chapter outlines and a bunch of a lot of summary about the book. And of course, there are links to the Amazon website, as well as the GitHub repo. OK, awesome. Um, all right, moving on to the next question. There is one really funny one, and then I missed. Oh, here you go, Raul. 
it's a multi-purpose book. You can work out, you can learn and work out by using it as a dumbbell. Um, all right, serious question here from Robert. How long do you estimate it would take to build a working model if I was starting this from scratch? What skills would be helpful? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, starting from scratch assumes that you do have some of the prerequisites, like you, you have used Python, you know how to use uh, Pandas or scikit-learn, right? Um, I mean, if you apply yourself to it in two to four weeks, uh, you, you can certainly have something running, probably sooner if you just use the examples that are there, yeah. you know? So, I mean, that you can literally do in, in an afternoon, right? Because we use Docker to install it, so you shouldn't have any installation issues. And some of the examples you can basically just run. I mean, you download the data, of course, it takes a few minutes, whatnot. But so that's not extremely time consuming. What takes more time is to really digest and understand the different building blocks, right? From the data to the feature engineering, to the algorithm, and then to all the things you can do on the trading side. So we don't go in the book a lot into how do you manage like risks? So the issue like stop loss orders and, you know, so we don't do very complex trading strategy that dynamically manage your holdings, you know? We basically take predictions and then very often do a long short strategy. That's a mm -hmm. whole different aspect, you know, on which there are, on which there are other books, right? So there you have more material. Um, there's like five to 10 books or so that have discussed that stuff at length. So uh, that, that takes a little bit longer, but you know, three months, I think, you know, will get you into a position where you feel much more comfortable using these different tools and you, you will be swimming sort of by yourself and start really developing your own ideas and implementing them. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. So two to four weeks or maybe three months, depending on your level of comfort, right? Um, okay, we have so many questions, but I'm actually going to take the very last question because we are going up on on time. Okay, let's go to Robin. What are the implications of using machine learning to handle missing data like KNN and dealing with outliers for extremities? Yeah, so it depends on what which sort of input data you um, you refer. So financial data, especially returns, something that has been looked at, you know, for a very long time. It's, and you probably heard of this phenomenon of fat tails and their outliers in the data. That's, that's a tricky topic because depending on the data source, it may have errors. So you have to really carefully look at if I have, and I'm just talking about uh, data, uh, market data, right? So price data and the returns that you calculate from those. Then you really have to investigate a little bit, you know, if large returns are real, because sometimes large returns happen. And right. there may also be just a data error. So stock, for instance, you know, stocks, they split. So suddenly you have twice the number of stocks or half the number of stocks or, or so, which means that the prices adjust accordingly. And if the data set didn't really reflect that properly or you didn't make the adjustments, then suddenly you have like 100% return there, which is just because you didn't factor in that, well, they just split uh, the stocks in, in, in two. So that would be a minus 50 return, I guess. But, you know, so, so you can have errors in the data or, um, or actual outliers and, um, sorry, or actual inliers that look like outliers. So you yeah. have to be a little bit careful there, maybe more so than in, in some other domains, you know? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I know I said that was the last question, but we do have a couple of questions asking if the session is recorded and is there a link? Yes. Um, there, this session will actually stay recorded on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on um, packed YouTube channel. I will later upload this to the Story by Day YouTube channel. So you'll find it in a whole bunch of different places and on Twitter. I'm not sure if it's actually live streaming on Twitter. I haven't checked. It's my first time. So might be on, on Story by Data Twitter as well. But Stefan, as we wrap up, uh, my last question to you is, what do you think is going to happen in the next five to 10 years, right? Just Realistically, in the not world. pessimistic or optimistic, but where do you where do you see the technology going in the trading space? I think that uh, just as in many other domains, uh, for those people that provide information research to a portfolio manager, that as a human still takes decision, it would be much more common to incorporate you know predictions, machine learning results, and so forth. Because simply, just like at some point Excel became normal, then Tableau became more standard. Just similarly, machine learning will become more standard, right? Either because people learn to code or because there will be better tools, right? So but that's one piece, right? So the analyst workflow is going to change. Then mm -hmm. uh, there will be more trading strategies that will become automated. So I work with clients that have strategies that are being run essentially manually today, but they use very specific 
quantitative signals already. So clearly, these are things that you can automate. You know, uh, they're very often based on you know some proprietary data feeds or, or what have you. But you can clearly translate that into a machine-driven strategy by simply learning how to react to these uh, signals automatically. And then often it becomes more stable, more robust, and more scalable at the same time. So these things will also become uh, more prevalent, you know. So which also means this is not that super exciting to do, right? Because essentially you monitor a certain number of, of, of indicators, right? And you have over a year learned, well, if these two go up and these go down and the other one is kind of in the middle, then maybe I should buy or, you know. So it's not necessarily the most exciting thing to do over time. So you can have machines do that and then you can think about other things doing yourself. So I think it will go similar a similar path as in other industries where you gradually automate, you get better information into the decision-making process and you automate some some tasks away and free up resources for others. Absolutely, thank you for that prediction. We'll replay this in five years and see if you were right. Um, on that note, so uh, the the last question I have for you really is: We have so many comments and questions still coming in from the live audience. Where is the best place for them to contact you? You know, if you haven't addressed their question yet, is it LinkedIn or do you have a, another site that you want people to go to with their questions? <clears throat> yeah. So um, in terms of about the book itself, the best place is to go to GitHub. And uh, so if you actually have questions about the book or you run into any issues, you know, GitHub has this issue feature, so you can just raise questions there, um, mm -hmm. then also others see it, or you look at other questions that folks have already asked, so maybe they have already been answered. Uh, if you have other questions, you know, that go beyond the book, feel free to get in touch on LinkedIn, and I'll do my best to, to respond as time permits. Okay, awesome. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for your time. I personally learned a lot, and I think the audience got a lot of value out of the session as well, so thank you for your time. Well, thanks for having me, and I hope it was useful for everybody else here. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Winners will be announced shortly by Ravit Jain. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.